Over the last four weeks, we've spent a great deal of time talking about the shape of God's kingdom. What does it look like? What, what does it mean? What are we talking about when we talk about the kingdom of God? But there's another very important question about the kingdom, a question that comes up throughout Scripture, a question that we raise ourselves when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, Thy kingdom come, and that is the question of when, when that kingdom will come. And so we address that question this morning. And so we turn to the 17th chapter of Luke, just a couple of short verses. Let us listen together for God's word. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is. Or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is is among you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we ask that you prepare our hearts for your kingdom. Prepare us for your work. Speak to us this morning by your word, we pray. Amen. Kids ask a lot of questions. All kids ask a lot of questions. My two kids are very young. My daughter is not quite two. The question that she asks all the time is, what's that? What's that? And she'll point to something, and I'm usually not sure what she's pointing to. So she'll say, what's that? And I'll say, what's what? And she says, I don't know. <laughs> As if she's saying to me, that's why I was asking you. And my son, who's three and a half, his, his favorite question, you could probably guess, is why? 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 And that answer to that question always leads to another why question and until you know, I or, or his mother get very frustrated and we just stop answering his questions. But we ask a lot of questions too. We may have moved beyond the simple question of what. What am I looking at? What is this world around me? We don't look at the world with the same awe and wonder that children look at. So maybe we've stopped asking the question what. We still ask the question why. That's a question we'll ask for the rest of our lives. But the question I think we ask most is when. I think that once we've moved beyond those basic questions of our childhood, we ask the question when. We wonder when things will change. We wonder when things will be different or when I'll be released from this situation or when that great thing that we're looking forward to will come. We ask the question when. It's a question that grows often out of discontent. It often grows out of, out of something in our lives that doesn't feel quite right, something in our lives that we would like to change. When we ask the question when, we think of, of our lives as a, as a, a sequence of events. A, a very, it's a very linear question that, that, that views the future as, as, as certain as the past is unchangeable, that, that the future is just inevitable and we're waiting for it to arrive. And so we ask the question when. Because we wonder how long things must go on this way. And so we ask the question when. The question seeks to close off the possibilities of the future. Because we want plans. We want to know what to expect. We want to know what's coming. We don't want to be surprised. We'd rather not prepare for the unexpected. And so we ask the question when. The two passages that we're looking at this morning are two very different responses of Jesus to that question when. The passage from Matthew, the, the longer one, was a part of actually a much longer passage, a much longer answer that Jesus gave to His disciples when His disciples came to Him and said, Jesus, when are these things that You're talking about going to happen? When? When is it going to happen? And Jesus goes into a very, very long description of the signs that the Son of Man is coming. This is one of the passages of the New Testament. There aren't too many until you get to Revelation, but one of those that is often turned to when, when we start to speculate about the end times, when we start to speculate about the end of the world, or however we, we might want to phrase that. Jesus' answer to them is he, he gives them a long list of signs, wars and rumors of wars. That's a phrase that probably sounds familiar. And he refers to some Old Testament passages, in particular Daniel, that speak of a, of a desolation in the temple 
the most holy place. So signs of, of what is to come. But then Jesus says that these are just the beginning. These are just the beginning. And Jesus sums it all up at the very end by saying that you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. He begins our passage by saying no one knows. Not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but only the Father. So you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Not a very satisfying answer for the disciples, I'm sure. And then we turn to these two verses in Luke. And this time it's not the disciples who ask, it's the Pharisees. The Pharisees ask. And he says that the kingdom is not the sort of thing you're going to be able to see coming. You're not going to be able to study the signs and say, look, here it is, or there it is over there. But the kingdom of God is among you. That phrase could be translated, the King James translate it, translates it, within you. One translator uses the phrase, within your grasp. The kingdom of God is within your grasp. A very different answer. A very different response to that question. The kingdom of God here sounds like something that might already be here. Whereas when Jesus is talking about it in Matthew's gospel, we get the sense that it's something future, something that's not here yet, something that we're waiting for. Now in Matthew, that passage is, is uh, there's a similar passage in Mark where part of what Jesus is talking about is the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened in 70 A.D., uh, 40 years after Jesus is crucified, the temple was destroyed. And so part of what, what Jesus is talking about in that passage is the destruction that was coming, the destruction that ultimately befell Jerusalem and the temple. But still, Jesus ends with ambiguity because He's not just talking about that, uh, that moment, that historical moment, but He's talking about something greater. He's talking about the coming of the Son of Man. But in Luke... In Luke, Jesus doesn't go into detail at all. Jesus cuts straight to that ambiguity. He cuts straight to that unsatisfying answer. And what has, has our discussion about the kingdom of God been but a series of unsatisfying answers to questions? The questions that we bring, the questions that others bring to Jesus. What is the kingdom of God? And it's notoriously difficult to grab onto. And so why shouldn't this be the, as well? This question of when, of when is it all going to happen? And so as we talk about the kingdom of God, what exactly does it mean to ask that question? When we ask, when will the kingdom come, what exactly are we asking? We're not asking, when will I die and go to heaven, right? The question can't possibly be that simple. We're not asking, when will Caesar be deposed and the kingdom of God be here? It's not that simple either. We're not asking when will the world meet its catastrophic end. As we've looked at the kingdom, as we've looked at Jesus' words about the kingdom, we've seen the way that it's something more this worldly. It's something more ongoing. Something that happens in smaller bits and pieces along the way. And not a great fireworks show at the end of history. So that can't be what we're asking either. Maybe we're asking something more like, when will we know that God is present among us? When will we know that God is in our midst? Or maybe something like, when will we see healing and restoration in this broken world? When will we see healing and restoration? When will our hearts and lives align with God's kingdom? When will our lives be shaped after God's good news? When will the life of the church demonstrate that good news to the world? These questions are not end time scenarios. These questions are possibilities. Possibilities that are very real here and now and yet still very challenging. <clears throat> in discussing this question in, in seminary, often professors would resort to a strange way to phrase it that was always frustrating, and yet I, I, and yet I still find it very true, and that is uh, a contrast between the already and the not yet. Doesn't that sound academic? The already and the not yet. That the kingdom of God is in some way already 
present. But the kingdom of God is not yet present. The not yet, we get that, right? That's the easy part. We look at the world around us, we know that the kingdom is not here. We know that this world is broken and in desperate need of help. We know that our lives are broken and in desperate need of help. We know that God's kingdom is not yet here. It's the not yet that sells books, novels and, and, and long theological books about the end of the world and what to expect and how to know it's coming, how to read the signs. The Father only knows, the Son doesn't know, the angels in heaven don't know, but this author knows. <laughs> we get the not yet. That's the obvious part. The, hardest, the harder part is the already. The harder part is to understand how in the world the kingdom of God is present here. We know that it was present in the life of Jesus. We know that in Jesus, He brought the kingdom of God face to face with the world. That in His ministry, in His teaching, in His healing, in His death and His resurrection, that the world got a glimpse of the kingdom of God in a man, in the flesh. But, but today... Today, how is the kingdom of God present? In Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel, if you, if you read it and you look at it with, with this lens, it's very quick. Mark's gospel moves from one thing to the next. He doesn't waste words. He goes right into it. He cuts right to the chase, story to story. The first words out of Jesus' mouth in the gospel of Mark are these. The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. No preamble, no prelude. Jesus cuts to the chase. The kingdom of God has come near. And that becomes the foundation of his ministry to demonstrate to the Jews and the world around that the kingdom of God has come near. But what does that mean? What does it mean for the kingdom of God to come near? <clears throat> I think that when we talk about the nearness of the kingdom, that the kingdom is not near in the way that an airplane that is about to land is near. Something that we can see on the horizon, something that we know is coming, and it's just a matter of time until it lands, it's inevitable. I don't think the kingdom is near in that way. It's not near like Monday is near to Sunday. It's not near like the sound of thunder is near to the flash of lightning. It's something quite different when Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near. It's baseball season, and I know we have a lot of baseball fans here, especially Tiger fans. The same thing that people hate about baseball is, is what others love about baseball. And that is that you really have to suffer through probably two hours when you add it all up of boredom <laughs> for maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes of, of pure excitement. And so I think the nearness of the kingdom of God is something a little bit more like the nearness of excitement to a baseball game. You can go inning after inning of pure boredom and then in a moment it explodes. And suddenly it's exciting. It might not happen. That excitement is not inevitable the way that a landing plane is inevitable and you'd better get out of the way. But it's a little bit different. I think the nearness of the kingdom of God is like, like a doctor who's on call. He's got his phone on or her phone on waiting for that call that might not come, but there's always the possibility that it's going to ring and that they're going to have to respond. It's like an archaeological dig where scientists are digging and digging and digging and the only thing that keeps them going is the possibility of a discovery. A discovery they may never make. It's not inevitable. It's not a sure thing, but they have to work at it and they keep digging and that discovery is always a possibility. I think the kingdom of God is near to us in the way that pain is near to us in raising children. It's not inevitable. It's not certain to happen that it's just a matter of time and we just wait for it. But it's always so very possible because we love our children so very much. The kingdom of God has come near. I think of a relay race at a track meet. And there's a moment in that relay race where the one who is waiting to, to receive the baton begins to run. And the one who is finishing up is catching up, and for a moment, they're running alongside each other, and the one has come near to the other, and the one who's just beginning has to reach out 
without looking, has to reach out and grab that baton. The runner has come near. And I think the nearness of the kingdom of God is something much more like that. The kingdom of God has come near. That very phrase suggests that we're talking about something different than the arrival of some future event. Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near. It's not the sort of thing that we're going to see coming by looking and saying, there it is, or here it is. We'll describe the signs. We'll know it scientifically. We'll, we'll come up with computer models. We'll know exactly what to expect. The kingdom of God has come near. And it's near to us in a very different way. The kingdom of God has come so near to us that we can almost reach out and touch it. I like that translation. The kingdom of God is within your grasp. The kingdom of God has come near. Here's how we understand the already. Here's how we understand the way that the kingdom of God is present here and now. Not because everything's perfect. Not because we look outside the window and it's obvious to us that God is here, God is at work, and everything's going to be okay. Because we know that's not the way it is. But the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is so very close. And so we live our lives trusting in the presence of that kingdom, knowing that God has come near to us, that the kingdom, this strange alternate reality, where the lowly are lifted up, the broken are fixed, the sick are healed. This strange reality is here. It's come near to us. It's, and, and so Jesus tells us to be prepared. To be prepared. That's ultimately Jesus' message. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is creating a sense of great urgency to be ready. To be ready for the kingdom because at a moment, it could be here. At a moment, we could see it. We could experience it. And so with our lives, we are ready for the kingdom. We live lives in accordance with God's kingdom, with this upside down, backwards set of values, this logic that makes no logical sense. We live our lives according to the kingdom of God so that we can be ready to see it because the kingdom of God is near. It's not a passive waiting. All we have to do is wait and it will come. It's an active waiting. It's an active participation. As our lives become a sign that we are prepared for the kingdom of God, as God continues to shape our lives after that kingdom, so that more and more, little by little, mustard seed by mustard seed, we are being shaped into a people of God's kingdom so that we are ready because the kingdom of God will come at an unexpected hour. Any moment, God could show up. Let us pray. God, we ask you to make us ready. Prepare us as your people to demonstrate to the world the goodness of your love, the power of your kingdom, the power made perfect in our weakness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.